welcome to Learn from the Experts, presented by the Women Business Owners Alliance. The WBOA is made up of 100 members, all women business owners of the Pioneer Valley and beyond. The guests you'll see on our show today are all members of the WBOA and are here to share their expertise and knowledge with you, our viewers. So sit back, relax, and let them wow you with their expertise. I'm Kim Shagnon, owner of Kim's Upholstery, and I'm here with my co-host. Hi there, I'm Carlene Hoffman from The Clutter Doctor, and we are so excited to present to you today, Planning for the Future. We'd like to welcome attorney Marie Jablonski and Ms. Freda Brown from Divorce Financial Services. Welcome, ladies. So great to see you. Glad to be here. So, Marie, um, what are the legal documents that everyone needs when they're planning for their future? Well, the most important document is a will. And this is something that is very difficult because people do not usually want to start thinking about dying. It kind of brings you down. However, it is very important to have. And if you don't have a will in Massachusetts, the government has a family tree that will tell you how your estate will be passed out. So you have spent your lifetime earning your money and whatever property and assets you have, and so it should come from you. What do you want to happen to your assets when you die? And so that's the reason why it's important to put those desires that you have into writing. So what happens if you don't put it in writing and you pass away unexpectedly? As I was saying, the state has a family tree that says who will get your assets, which usually, if the person is married, the spouse gets the largest portion, and then other uh, children and other relatives. However, there may be reasons why you may not want all your children to obtain the same percentage of your assets. Uh, for example, one of your children may be disabled and receive some government benefits that will be uh, compromised if you, if that, if that person inherits from you. A second example is that one of your children may be single and have gone to just say Harvard Medical School and another one of your children may be married and have six of your grandchildren. So looking at it, at their own assets, which one of those would benefit from the largest portion of your estate? So every family is different, and that's why it's important to discuss it with a lawyer and make a plan as to what would be the best for you and your family. Okay. So if there's, so just to be clear, so if there's uh, three children, and, and one second wife, the second wife would have um, more than the three children of the um, person who died. And that brings up another uh, good document to have, which is a prenuptial agreement. So many folks are getting married for the second or third time, uh, depending on their circumstances for various reasons, and have children from their prior relationships. And in that case, if you are approaching marriage again, it's important to realize that your spouse will have a strong inheritance uh, by law if you were to pass away and have no prenuptial agreement. So if you want a portion or all or uh, some of your assets to pass on to your children or others, not your new spouse. It's very important to do the prenuptial agreement, again, with advice from an attorney so that you can look at your own family, which is different from every other family, and see what the needs are of your children, your grandchildren, as you approach marriage. Also for young people, in, the, in days gone by, people thought that prenuptial agreements were only for rich people. Yeah. However, yes, uh, <laughs> and we've heard of fame, <laughs> we've all heard of sports figures and mm -hmm. actresses and actors and with, you know, large estates. 
that those are the people that have to worry about prenuptial right. agreements. But that's not really the case anymore. There may be a family owned business, for example, that th the family wants to pass on to their son or daughter, not to the new mm -hmm. family, which might come into play as years go by. So there are many reasons to make this plan of a prenuptial agreement prior to marriage. And so, so the prenup uh, outdoes the will. So if you just yes. put it in the will, oh. it's not the, 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 who, there could be problems if it's just in the will that you want it to go to, to the children. The new wife could say, or the new husband could say, I want my share over That's correct. The will. It's called a spousal elective share. And the spouse has the right in the law to override the will and take their spousal elective share if there is no if prenup, no prenup yeah. agreement. Huh. So are you finding nowadays, just with the general crowd, that people are more apt to do that? Because I know in the past it seemed kind of, you know, bad to think about doing something like that. The prenup, you that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I was just was watching kind of uh, last night the uh, How to Get Away with Murder, and, and, <laughs> and one of the law students uh, is getting married to a, a rich boy and the mother-in-law the new mother-in-law to be is coming to see her and says you need to sign this prenup and she says i'm getting married for love i plan to stay married forever i don't need a prenup and the mother-in-law says if you don't sign this prenup i'm canceling the wedding <laughs> <laughs> and that is a more frequent occurrence that that is happening and i have seen an increase in people using prenuptial agreements. They have been uh, in front of the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts. So there have been court cases that have come to pass because of prenuptial agreement. And again, not just uh, w wealthy people. I bring mm -hmm. up Barry Bonds, the ball player, who had a kind of famous uh, marriage and divorce and prenuptial agreement that was a court case. But now the general public has uh, cases that may come in front of the court. And so s the opinion, a a and you know, uh, men and women differ on this, but often it's women who say, oh, it's so unromantic to have a prenuptial agreement. But my comment to that is that, first of all, marriage is a business transaction. That is one of the purposes of marriage, and it is a contract in the law and you have contractual um, responsibilities to each other in the law. And it is very unromantic to have a long drawn out bitter divorce case <laughs> in front of a probate court judge if you don't have the prenuptial agreement. Mm -hmm. So looking at it realistically, it's in everybody's best interest to get legal advice prior to marriage and form the first contract that you will make together, the prenuptial agreement. And that could be just for, just in case something happens, in case I die, you know, what, what's going to happen with the estate as opposed to not just getting a divorce, but dying That's makes correct. a difference. It helps with the prenup as well. So generally in the pre prenuptial agreement, we address two things. One of the spouses dies, what happens to the assets? Mm -hmm. And if there's a divorce, what happens to the assets? So those two things are the two things that are going to happen. One person is going to die, yeah. that's inevitable. And hopefully you won't get a divorce, but if there was a divorce, there would be a plan that was made by the parties right. in advance and they would be able to go forward with carrying those plans out and they would avoid a long and expensive divorce case because they have their contract mm. already written. And I think so. in a divorce situation, prior to divorce, one of the reasons people get divorced is money issues. And sometimes you come into the marriage when one party's a saver and the other party's a spender and they don't realize it and, they, and that's part of the reason why they're not getting along. If they have to do some financials ahead of time, EKA the um, 
prenup. prenup, they're putting those financials in, you know exactly where you stand and you have a better idea to make that conversation ahead of time so that you're on the same page with finances instead of fighting over them and ending in divorce over them. And as an addendum to the prenuptial agreement, each party is asked to give a list of assets and you know, in the heat of the moment, so to speak, of love, people may not disclose that they owe 30000 in credit card debt, <laughs> which may come to a sh as a shock <laughs> to the system <coughs> of yeah. uh, the other side. So that's this full disclosure process that it's never happened to me that I've seen, but it may cause someone to step back and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't be going forward with this marriage, right. or at least maybe we should get some premarital financial counseling and see financial service people such as Freda or others that could assist them with setting up a budget and taking care of the looking into why is there 30000 in credit card debt and how are we going to handle that when our names are both going on a credit report or a mortgage yeah. application. So I know both Kim and I had to deal with this recently. Can you explain to our viewers a little bit about a health care proxy, what it's used for? Mm -hmm. Yes, a health care proxy is a person that you appoint to make health care decisions for you. You would have to make the appointment of this person before you became incompetent, incoherent, in a coma, dementia, other uh, medical reasons why you could not make a decision for yourself anymore or, or even temporarily. So you appoint a person who you would trust. Uh, spouses often appoint each other but you don't have to and we ask people in the f standard forms that are used ask you to select an alternate as well in case that first person is somehow unwilling, unavailable or becomes unable to carry out their duties. So that person would sign for surgery. I recall signing for my mother to have a shunt put into her brain, which caused her great, um, a great eight more years of life that she had. But at the time, the doctor said to me, your mother is incompetent. I see that you've, she signed for you to be her healthcare proxy, and we need you to sign for her to have this surgery. And as I said, it was quite successful. However, my mother was temporarily incompetent. So those things are, are going to be uh, important to have these folks lined up. Also important to talk with them in, in advance. What would you like mm -hmm. for, your, for your last, yeah. if it was your last days? If you had uh, cancer, would you like uh, food and water? Would you like pain medication? Those are questions that it's important to discuss with your proxy so they will know how to respond and give you the best type of quality of life as you pass down that somewhat difficult road. Now what about in the case of like if you own real estate and you've got someone who's getting up in their age, should they sign the property over to the children while they're still living there and when they're still alive? And I ask this because I had a friend recently whose mother wanted to, had signed the property over to three children and had decided she was going to move in with one child, but she needed to sell the property in order to make the move. The okay. other two children fought it and said, no, the house is ours, you can't sell it without our permission and we're really fighting the mother on this. So how does mm -hmm. something like that pan out? And that's an important uh, question and a good example. So as I say to all my clients, every family is different. So you would need, before you sign your deed over, you would need to examine who are my three, four, five children? What are their needs? What are their families look like? looking like? Mm -hmm. Are they married to someone that I don't like, don't trust, is a spendthrift, uh, goes to fr Foxwoods often? <laughs> is that <laughs> someone? Or, or MDF? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is really a consideration yeah. as to who you're going to be signing your deed over. Also, the lawyer who prepares this new deed, 
most definitely would be explaining to this person, do you realize you will no longer be the owner and you will not have the power to sign, to sell your home? That power you are now giving to your children who, who would have to all agree to that. Mm -hmm. So in families where everyone gets along, even in those kind of families, it's still important to have the conversation as to whether that's the best decision. And, and what's so, that difference between a life estate? And sometimes when the person signs the deed over, they retain or keep in the document a life estate, which is the right to live there until you die. And so they are a life tenant. They pay the taxes, repairs, and they have all rights to live there, even though the property is owned by their children or whomever mm -hmm. they have signed it over to. And it, as a tax professional, I'm also do, I'm a master tax advisor and an EA with the uh, enrolled agent. So when you have a life estate and the, um, the kids are, are going to inherit that, it's really considered an inheritance at that point. So the uh, stepped up value at the time of death is what their um, value is when they, when they receive that house as opposed to if you're just giving the house to them and passing over to the deed, their basis is their parents' basis. And so if they go to sell the house, it's a difference because of, as an example, mom bought the house, mom and dad bought the house for $30,000 and put in maybe $50,000 of work. And so it's worth uh, 80,000, you know, their, their basis is 80,000, but its value right now is 150. Okay, so if you go, to sell the house for 150 when mom dies and except that you've got you you it, the house became yours you're paying a, a gain on the the difference between 150 and the 80,000 mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's you're you're getting that basis but if you're using the life estate it becomes the stepped up basis what is that value at the time of death mm -hmm. 150,000 i'm selling it for 150,000 we got 150,000 tax free dollars Yes, I always advise people to check with a tax professional about the effect of this signing of yeah. the deed over to them, uh, over to their parents signing their house over to them. Because it's going to be different for every family and depending on the numbers of people that are mm -hmm. going to inherit. Yeah. You know, one fourth, one third, one half, those percentages and numbers will be different in every family. Right. So what happens in the unfortunate case, which unfortunately does happen to many families, is you get to the process that, you know, the parent has passed away, there's a will in place, and the kids still insist on fighting. What happens in that case? Does the executor kind of take over, or do attorneys jump in? Can the kids do this? Well, usually if people are in a disagreement in a family, unfortunately they may each go to a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And so each lawyer, and I explain to people, uh, someone needs to get appointed as the, it used to be called executor, it's called personal representative, and the, the court who appoints this person is gonna look at the will, who did the deceased want? That's their first step. Who mm -hmm. did they want as their personal representative to control this process? And that person will get appointed. And I explain to my clients the thousands and thousands of dollars in legal fees it will be if they fight with their brothers, sisters, and other heirs because the wishes of the deceased in the will, as long as it's a valid will, are going to be carried out. So they can't control it by starting a court case or bringing another lawyer in. Mm -hmm. Each lawyer who comes in is going to explain you're really not going to be helped by filing court cases and opposing what the deceased said they want in the will because there's a strong presumption of the rights of the deceased to select who they want for the executor and for the percentages of who their beneficiaries are. And so I, I explain to people, let's get somebody appointed that person has the right to then set up an estate account, mm -hmm. start putting the assets into the account, put the home for sale if that's what's going to be happening. We also have meetings. Uh, if they want to have a lawyer, they c the other side could have a lawyer. 
and we have meetings among us all and discuss what's the best way to carry this out. Most of the time, there's after one meeting or one appearance in front of the judge in the probate court who explains what's going to happen, people usually realize, oh, okay. But sometimes people need to hear it from the judge. From and so they'll yeah. have that opportunity. Yeah. It costs money to do that, but they'll, they'll have the opportunity to stand in front of a judge. So is the executor of the will generally somebody who is also in the will, or is it somebody independent from the division of property so that they don't have that personal stake, so to speak? It could be either way. Either. Again, the family is, uh, every family is different. I have people, had people come in uh, f a few months back and they said, I have a friend, these are folks in their 60s, uh, the husband had a friend and he said, this man has known my children, my children are now 30 and 40 years old, I would like this friend to control everything, be the personal representative. And that is how they wanted to write their estate documents mm -hmm. and write their will. So none of their children would be in control. It would be this outside person who, as the uh, husband described, would be fully capable of handling disputes and making sure the disputes did not get out of hand. Mm -hmm. Do you see a lot of cases where the, there are a lot of disputes at the end. Uh, not a lot, well, because usually hear. we have told them during their lifetime, this docu <laughs> the purpose of this document is to uh, eliminate disputes. Yeah. You have the right to say what you want to happen to your assets, and that's why we're taking all these steps to write the will. It, you know, it has to be signed in the presence of three witnesses. There's lots of uh, details that have to be done mm -hmm. correctly and provisions to be made to the will, and that's how we make sure that it's uh, a valid will and carries out the wishes of the deceased. And then the only problem comes if they remarry. The, the, the uh, <laughs> and there's not a prenup. <laughs> yes, because the, the that's prenup. true. Because, but then if they have been to an attorney before their second, third marriage, they would know that their first will is invalid by remarriage your first will becomes in, invalid. Uh, uh -huh. So, uh -huh. so that's, yeah. Yeah. The yes, so, uh, <laughs> yes, the plot thickens, right. So you would do a new will upon your remarriage. So what kind of things happening in your life should trigger the thought that, okay, I need to revise my will? You know, marriage, obviously, you just said is one. What other things uh, should people think about that would make them have a revision? What about starting a new business? That's an example. New business, receiving a large inheritance, mm -hmm. uh, your children receiving a large inheritance from, from their spouse's family, uh, somebody going bankrupt, birth of a child, birth of a grandchild. Somebody becoming disabled. Mm -hmm. Someone becoming disabled. So there's many steps or anything that would change the financial circumstances. Somebody's in a, God forbid, uh, ac uh, accident where there's a serious injury or a death, automobile accident. Those are things that are going to change the financial circumstances. So do you tell clients to like reevaluate every certain number of years? Do you kind of give them a guideline or? Sometimes, depending on the, the people, I say uh, five years from now, let's mm -hmm. talk about this again. Or I talk about those kind of changes. Mm -hmm. Somebody's born, gets divorced, somebody dies. Let's talk about this again. Mm -hmm. Well, we're just about out of time, ladies. Attorney Marie Jablonski, Freda Brown from Divorce Financial Services, thank you so much for being with us today. And a thank you to our viewers. We certainly hope that you enjoyed our show. And for more information about our guests or about any of our WBOA members, please take a look at our website at www.wboa.org. Thank you for joining us. Thanks.